Hey, good morning, Ready First. My name is Colonel Stephen Fairless. I have the honor of being your brigade commander of the Ready First Combat Team. Today is the first of a series of videos that we'll shoot, uh, some with me, some with uh, the Command Sergeant Major Beidel, uh, some with uh, other teammates. In all these videos, we're not going to read Army doctrine to you. Uh, we expect that you've got access to Army Publishing Directorate and that you're gonna be able to read the doctrinal manuals. You're gonna be, uh, you're gonna be current on the Army doctrinal manuals. What these videos are going to do is provide an interpretation and application of Army doctrine of our standard operating procedures, uh, of the way that we do business. I'd like to start off talking about how we command and control, and more importantly, our approach to the philosophy of mission command. So we're gonna be using ADP 6.0 mission command as a reference, but again, I'm gonna go off that. I'm gonna give you an interpretation uh, in application of uh, mission command as a philosophy, and hopefully it's, it, it's a little bit easier you know, for you to understand what we mean, what the Army means by mission command as a philosophy. So first of all, mission command as a philosophy is the Army's technique for empowering subordinates to execute disciplined initiative to accomplish the intent, the purpose, the why of the mission. And that's really what we're gonna focus on. We're gonna focus on the why, the purpose of the mission. And we'll get into a little bit more of the what and the how later on. But first of all, uh, for you to be able to understand it, you're gonna have to bear with me. I'm gonna switch metaphors with you. I'm gonna use the dry erase board in just a moment to help us visualize what this mission command as philosophy means. I personally did not quite understand it until I saw a senior leader at a brigade uh, pre-command course teaching these soon-to-be brigade commanders and command sergeants major his interpretation of it. This was five years ago. That senior leader did not make this up. He received that same visualization, that same instruction, that same coaching from a mentor of his when that senior leader was a major. And that uh, he was working for a brigade commander, now lieutenant general retired. They didn't make it up. Previously, we called mission command as a philosophy, battle command using mission type orders. We still use mission orders. The 19th century Prussians termed it Aufstrag Taktik under von Moltke. The point is, what you're about to go through, what we're going to discuss, and what you're gonna read or have read in 6.0, it's not new. It's just a new application, new approach to a time-honored philosophy of how armies have fought you know, for centuries. So if I'm going to give you an order, I as your higher headquarters, I as your higher level commander, owe you several things. And that's what we're gonna walk through on the visualization. So first of all, metaphorically, I'm gonna frame out that box in which I expect you to operate. And then we're gonna switch metaphors, and we're gonna turn that box into a target frame, and we're gonna talk your shot group versus my shot group uh, in that target frame. It'll make sense in a moment. So first of all, for me to frame up this box in which I expect you to operate, and I'm left-handed and I have horrible handwriting, so uh, you guys can all capture that on video. I'm gonna frame out this box in which I want you to operate. The first thing I owe you as a higher level commander is my commander's intent. Yes, I owe you mission, task, and purpose. And then I owe you very personally, my commander's intent. There are three components of commander's intent which, with which we're all familiar, right? You have the purpose, you have the key tasks, and then we have the end state. I wanna walk through all three of those. The purpose. The purpose is not the same purpose as what you'll find in the mission statement. It's not a regurgitation of that, uh, the task and purpose that you find in the mission statement. Rather, it's broader. It helps you understand where do we fit in the larger scheme of things. Some will call it the why of the why. For others, that's confusing. So the purpose and the commander's intent helps the subordinates, at least two levels down, understand where in my visualization as your commander where does the successful execution of this mission, what does it support? What is it helping? What is it accomplishing beyond just the immediate tasks at hand? So that's the purpose, key tasks. 
key tasks per doctrine, you look in 5.0, you look in 6.0, are not very, you know, you're not gonna be able to direct lift specified tasks from these, rather they're broader. They're, they are those things that in aggregate accomplish or lead to the successful accomplishment of my end state. All right, so let's talk end state. End state, again, is my description of how I visualize the formation at the successful conclusion of the mission. Right? And it's broken down into a few you know, components. Right? Uh, we have uh, end state with respect uh, to uh, the physical stance, uh, the capabilities of the organization, uh, the terrain. Well, where is it physically going to be? You know, we have end state with respect uh, to uh, the enemy. Uh, what effects or what capabilities uh, do we want to have on the enemy or leave the enemy you know, at a bare minimum? Right. Uh, time, civil considerations. All those factor into helping you understand the, my visualization of the end state that I want to have the, the brigade. What it also does is it informs the level of risk in which I'm willing to accept in the accomplishment of this mission. Right. Uh, so if I, for example, tell you uh, that uh, at the completion of this operation, the Ready Force Combat Team is set along phase line green with no less than 90% combat power, prepared to resume offensive operations within the next six hours, I'm probably, and then go down the other factors as well, I'm probably not going to accept a whole lot of risk to force in the accomplishment of this mission. If, however, I communicate within my end state uh, that the Ready Force Combat Team is set in a hasty defense vicinity along phase line green, having passed for 2nd Brigade and is prepared to resume offensive operations within 96 hours. I'm probably going to accept more risk to force in the accomplishment of this mission because I anticipate that we're going to have at least 96 hours before we have to resume offensive operations. So again, the commander's end state helps you understand not just the visualization, but also begins to communicate the level of acceptable risk. In this case, I used risk to force. Could be risk to mission. Right? As we get in to some of the factors of mission commander's philosophy, could be professional risk. Could be risk to your career, to my career. And we'll talk about that. So the first thing I owe you, and I, as I frame out this box, is commander's intent. Now I'm gonna frame out the rest of this box in which I expect you to operate. And then we're gonna talk about what makes it work. So the first, the next thing I owe you are constraints, then restraints, and finally limitations. Constraints, thou shalt, thou must, things you must do. It could be as simple as LD no later than, you must LD no later than. You must seize, All right? It could be task organization changes. You must accept or give away these resources. Restraints, thou shalt not, you must not. So now I'm, I'm restraining your initiative. All right, so again, it could be LD no earlier than. You shall not LD earlier than this time. If you do, you're gonna desynchronize our other operations as an example. Limitations. Limitations are facts, right? The time available is certainly going to limit your freedom of action and the level of fidelity that I'm giving you to put into your own plan, right? It could be, again, assets available. The fact that you don't have all the assets that you would prefer in execution of this mission, it's a fact, but it's, it's a limitation potentially. So now I've framed out this box in which I'm gonna ask you to operate. I've given you commander's intent, constraints, restraints, limitations. All right, so now, as we look at this, as you're looking at the mission that I've given you to execute, if I were to execute this mission that I've given you, I know exactly how Fairless would do it, right? So we're gonna switch metaphors now, so this box is now target frame. All right, so within this target frame, uh, if I were to accomplish the mission that I just gave you, I'm center mass, right? I, I know exactly how I would accomplish the mission given what I've given you to do it, but I'm not the one doing it, you are, right? 
So the question is, and since it's a video, it's rhetorical. The question is, would you come up with the same concept, the same visualization, the same idea of how to accomplish the mission I gave you with all this as what I'm gonna come up with? And the answer is no. We're different people. We have different levels of experience, different backgrounds, uh, different uh, propensities, different levels of understanding. You as a subordinate commander or leader have a higher fidelity level of understanding of your formation and its capabilities than I do. I typically, hopefully, have a broader understanding of your capabilities, limitations, and of the overall organization. And I have a different understanding, different perspective of two levels up and two levels down capabilities and expectations. So your visualization of how to accomplish this mission on this target frame, your shot's gonna be different than mine. It's gonna be offset. So say it's over here, or say it's over here, whatever. As long as you're hitting that target frame, as long as you're back in that metaphorical box in which I asked you to operate, you're good, all right? If your shot is out here, now you're off the target frame, all right? And we wanna talk about both of these. So if I'm going to adhere to the philosophy of mission command per ADP 60 I have to understand and accept that your visualization the way that you're going to approach the problem I gave you to solve is going to be different from mine. If, however, it falls within this box on this target frame that I gave you, this delta is risk. I need to understand what that risk is and I need to accept that risk for you because I'm giving you this mission, I'm not doing it myself. If I want it done exactly like that, I'll do the mission myself. That's not why we exist. So this delta, so how do I understand what this delta is? Well, we, we have doctrinal uh, framework for that, confirmation briefs. Confirmation briefs occur immediately after the op order, right, and it's boss, I understand the words that are coming out of your mouth. That's it. So I understand my task purpose, I understand my assets available, I understand the time that you've given me, I understand the specified tasks as briefed by your staff or as written in this order. Here are my procedural questions or I have no procedural or admin questions. That's it, that's confirmation brief. That's the first way to check to make sure that we have a common understanding. Now you're gonna go, you're gonna conduct your own MDMP or troop lean procedures depending on which echelon you are and you're gonna come and back brief me, right? This is another form of rehearsal. The back brief is your, the subordinate's understanding, the subordinate's plan to accomplish the intent, uh, to accomplish what I asked you to do. Right, so you're gonna come and you're gonna back brief me. Again, in that back brief, here's where that delta is gonna become evident. So I'm now going to understand that your concept and approach is different than mine and probably better quite frankly, for your organization on how to accomplish my intent within the constraints, restraints, limitations. Now that I understand that, I underwrite that risk. If I'm not comfortable with it, I can adjust the plan, I can give you additional resources, I can change one or multiple of these dynamics. If I'm not changing any of this, then I'm comfortable with that delta, I underwrite the risk, you move out, you're covered. Right. Again, it doesn't necessarily need to be tactical. It could be within garrison. Hey boss, given the priorities that you told me, given this current mission that competes with my AR350-1 requirements to accomplish this within this period of time. What's the priority? This is the priority. Okay, then therefore, I'm not gonna be able to accomplish what 350-1 tells me within a timely manner. Okay. Again, that, that's risk that I understand that I underwrite and if I'm smart, I'm gonna communicate that to the appropriate level commander above me as well. All right, just so everyone has an understanding of what we're doing, okay? If, however, you come back, you back brief me and your concept is outside of that box, off that target frame uh, that I constructed for you, it's not my role as your su as superior commander to shoot you in the face over that. All right, rather, first of all, I need to look to myself. Did I clearly communicate commander's intent, constraints, restraints, limitations? Did my subordinate understand? Yes, she gave me a confirmation brief. 
All right, so then I've got to look to see what do I need to do to coach you back into that box, back onto that target frame, make whatever adjustments we need to make. Now that we've got you in there, now we make the, uh, we're set, we confirm the adjustments, we uh, synchronize any disruptions that those adjustments have made to the overall plan, and you move out. Now you may have a subordinate that constantly falls out of your target frame either in, in back brief or in execution. If after your best efforts to coach her, him back in, you're unable to do that, and then we have to execute the next man up drill and put someone else in charge. All right, so that is generally the philosophy of mission command in execution. But we're skipping past a very significant point. Again, it, it requires the disciplined initiative of the subordinates. So. Here's how we test that. On occasion, sometimes an extremist, but on occasion, a subordinate may be compelled to disobey what or how I asked you to do a task in order to accomplish the why. You know, you, it could be as simplistic as, hey, I want you to seize Hill 101 in order to destroy the enemy there. Well, Fairless, he gave me both terrain and force-oriented objectives. Where, where am I focused? What, is, what am I oriented on? I want you oriented on the enemy. Okay, got it. So you go do your leader's recon. You're looking at Hill 101. The enemy's not there. They're on Hill 102. Uh, you, 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 you can't get me up on the net. Uh, your radio dropped to fill. There's no time. Do you seize 101? Or you destroy the enemy on 102? Right. If you're operating within the intent, you take the initiative and you destroy the enemy on 102. Now, again, discipline initiative. So you have to understand the broader implications of your disobedience in order to accomplish my intent. You have to understand by you changing your actions, what are the impacts on the broader organization? If you're a company commander, what are the other companies doing within your battalion? What's the adjacent company from a neighboring battalion doing? Am I going to unhinge or put my forces, risk to force, am I going to put my forces at additional risk because I'm changing what I was told to do because I cannot communicate it back, right? So you, you've got, that's the gut check moment. I and mean, that's why it's disciplined initiative. It's not just out there flop, uh, flapping. So that's the test. Well, how do we get to that point? Yep. 6.0 does a great job of highlighting mutual trust. None of this works unless it's predicated upon a foundation of mutual trust. And that's not kumbaya trust fall stuff. That's repetition of shared experience. That's leaders with the lead and being engaged. Right? It's, not, it's not just little pockets of leaders doing leader stuff in the motor pool uh, while all the subordinates are doing command maintenance or leaders in the coughs while command maintenance is going on or the wash rack is going on. Right? It's leaders with the lead. It's being there with them, learning with, learning from, and teaching your subordinates. Right? It's repetition of training events. It's hard training out in the field. It's focus during command maintenance. It's how do I conduct proper inventories uh, in support of my command supply discipline program. It's those repetitions, right? Different leaders are going to have different levels of familiarity and different comforts with their subordinate leaders and with their adjacent leaders, with their peers and with their superiors. It's through repetition of shared experience, being there, being present, being engaged, that we begin to build that trust upon which all this is predicated. Without that shared trust, this doesn't happen. I'd like to take the final couple minutes and just talk about a, a, a couple of misperceptions with the philosophy of mission command. First of all, you'll have people who believe that it only works tactically, it doesn't work in garrison. Well, I would counter that unless you get it to work in garrison, it'll never work tactically. This mission command as a philosophy isn't part of our TA-50, our OCIE that we put on as we're heading out to the field. 
This has to be how we do business on a day-to-day basis. And it's tough, it's hard, it's challenging. None of us have gotten it right perfectly our entire careers or in any given duty position, right? So how do you practice that? Where can you assume risk as a higher level commander or leader and allow your subordinates to learn and to make mistakes, to make honest, earnest mistakes Sins of commission versus sins of omission. Encourage them to make the, the mistakes, to learn, to grow. AR it, then move out. Right? So it must work in garrison. We must force ourselves and discipline ourselves to work in garrison. Now let's talk a little bit of a difference uh, or perception on um, micromanagement. Okay, this is the pitfall for mission command as philosophy within the minds of junior leaders. And that's not junior in a pejorative sense, that jun- that's junior in experience level and familiarity and comfort, uh, not only at, with themselves as a leader, but also within the Army system. First of all, micromanagement is a good and useful tool. Yeah, I said that on video. For a very discreet period of time, for a very discreet purpose, then you put that thing back away when you're done, and you put it under double locks. If you must micromanage, so micromanagement is I'm, I have to tell you step-by-step step how to do something. I give you no freedom of maneuver, no initiative to figure out how to do something. There are occasions due to uh, subordinate leader experience or inexperience, lack of familiarity with the situation, with the, with the equipment, with the formation, uh, lack of time, uh, whatever the case may be, there may be a reason to micromanage. Understood. Put it away as soon as you're done with it. Only reach out for it under that double lock when you must. Micromanagement, though, is not the same thing as understanding and learning your subordinates, understanding that they have a firm framework on why they are doing what they're about to do. What is the reference? So you've got to build that trust through shared experience. Why are you doing it that way? What is your reference? How did you come to that decision? Is there another way that you could do this? Who have you asked? Who have you learned from? What have you read? Being, I've heard a senior leader term micro-involved or micro-engaged. Being involved, being engaged. So you understand you develop that trust, you develop that shared experience, and now you better understand the thought processes behind one of your subordinates, individual, so this is name tag dependent, why he or she came to that conclusion, how they arrived. The more you are comfortable that they are using army doctrine, they are using a logical coherency to how they're approaching your problem sets that you gave them, you build more trust, you give them more leeway. So I wanna emphasize that, right? So again, mission command as a philosophy per ADP 60. It's very straightforward, it's harder to practice. And we have to discipline ourselves to practice. You have to become comfortable in the ambiguous environment of I am delegating control. Remember, delegation is not abdication. Delegation means I'm giving you the task and the trust to accomplish the mission, but I still wanna understand how you're gonna go about doing it, right? But you're going to accomplish this mission on my behalf. That's delegation, abdication is Hey, you figure it out, you know, the old Band of Brothers movie. Hey, first on you sort out things here, I'm gonna to go to regiment. That's abdication, that's not what we're about. So delegation is uncomfortable, especially as a junior leader, especially if this is your only repetition in that duty position at this training event. There's still time to delegate. There's still time to entrust mission command as a philosophy to your sporting leaders. So that's my challenge to you, well, all of us And I welcome you to challenge me on how am I doing on mission command and philosophy as your brigade commander. So if we hold ourselves accountable to approach this and to do it the best we can, we are gonna make a much more flexible and aggressive organization that is comfortable operating in ambiguity and will be much more successful in the long run, not just in our immediate mission accomplishment, but also in helping to develop generations of leaders who are comfortable operating within the philosophy of mission command. 
I welcome your comments and your feedback, and I look forward to seeing you on the training. Ready first.